and uh, now's the time to deal with any electronic devices and also any relevant interests to declare related to the business. If not, we shall proceed. Um, there's apologies from Gordon Dunn and Emma Rogan, and then we'll be joined by Starleaf, uh, by Doug, um, Paul, Rachel, Sinead and Gemma. And if the clerk can advise of any delegation of votes. Thank you. Understanding Order 1156. Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to the chairperson, Paul Given, and Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the deputy chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. The draft minutes are there, members, and they pack if you're content that they're an accurate reflection, then I'll sign them off. Read. Read. Matters arising. Correspondence from um, FOIL on the damages bill, so it's in the meeting pack. The Forum for Insurance uh, Lawyers has written highlighting the continuing imperative to progress the damages bill and um, obviously the committee are seeking to do that, so it's there for noting. Uh, item 3 is correspondence from the Minister in respect of the Justice Mil Miscellaneous Bill. and The Minister has written advising that a paper has issued to the Executive seeking approval of the Bill, um, which is now called the Justice Bill, and indicating that, subject to the necessary approvals being provided, she hopes to introduce the Bill in May. Uh, the Minister has provided an advanced copy of the Justice Bill and the explanatory memorandum, and the Department has also written confirming the content of the Bill. Uh, there's no changes from the information provided to the Committee at last week's meeting, so members are asked just to note the information. An oral evidence session on the principles of the Bill will be scheduled following its introduction. Uh, item 4 uh, is the development of a joint secure and justice campus for children. At the Woodlands Lake uh, Wood site, the clerk has discussed the potential of holding a joint oral evidence session on the results of this consultation and proposals um, with the clerk of the Health Committee. The Health Committee is due to consider the consultation analysis reported at its meeting this week and then further discussion on a joint committee meeting and an informal meeting with organisation representing children in care. The justice system will take place and members will be updated in uh, due course. So, item four is the Department of Justice final budget allocations, and officials are joining us via the Starleaf facility. The relevant papers are in the meeting pack. Uh, the additional information requested by the committee at last week's meeting was emailed to members yesterday, and it's also in the tabled pack, together with a copy of the department submission to the audit office, detailing estimated COVID-19 costs totalling £55.3 uh, million. Pounds. So, hopefully, the officials are able to. Uh, be brought in at this stage. Is this the norm, the norm now? They're up. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Um, so, can I formally welcome uh, Deborah, uh, Director of the Justice Delivery Unit, uh, Ronnie Armour, uh, Director of Reducing Offending, Director at Anthony Harbison. Director of Access to Justice, Director and Julie Harrison, Director for Safer Communities, all from the Department of Justice. So, you're all very welcome. Um, to the committee and thank you for joining us. We'll record this by Hansard and published on the committee web page in due course as well. So Deborah, I think I'm handing over to you at this stage. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, can I just check that you can hear us okay? You can, yes. Lovely. Super, thank you. Well good afternoon um, and thank you for the opportunity to update you um, on the um, outcome of the final budget for 21-22. Um, so joining me this afternoon, um, I have Julie Harrison, who is our Director of Safer Communities, Anthony Harbinson, Director of Access to Justice, and Ronnie Armour, our Director of Reducing Offending. So what we want to do today is to give you um, an update on the final 21-22 budget allocation. In addition to that, there have been additional in-year funding that has been confirmed, but cannot be allocated as part of this budget but we give you that update as well. And we also want to give you an update on the year ending there in March 21. So on the 1st of April, the 21-22 budget was agreed by the executive, subject to assembly debate and a vote following Easter recess. The final opening budget allocations was communicated to spending areas on the 14th of April. Since that budget um, was drafted and uh, published, there was, as I say, some additional funding confirmed, which is in-year funding. Normally, you would wait for that in-year funding at a June monitoring round, but for the purposes of this, um, the executive agreed to confirm this funding, and then it would be formalised through the normal monitoring rounds. The additional funding for the executive was announced in the Chancellor's budget statement on the 3rd of March. 
That provided 407.7 million of funding for COVID and an additional 4.2 million of resource Dell. And then there has also been a more recent announcement of further funding for Health in England, which then provides a Barnet consequential of 224 million. HM Treasury have agreed also that some of the COVID-19 funding that was provided later in the part of 2021 and remained unspent could be carried forward into 21-22, and that was an amount of 238 million. And that is on top of what we are normally able to carry forward under the normal budget exchange scheme. So as I said, although this funding has been confirmed by Treasury, it hasn't been confirmed by the Secretary of State, and therefore it doesn't form part of the final budget. However, as I said, the allocations have been confirmed by the Executive, and they will be formalised in the normal way in the in-year monitoring rounds. That funding has been allocated, and there remains 81 million, which is being held centrally for COVID support schemes, and 103.9 million, which is being held pending the assessment of the health position. Moving to the 21-22 budget allocation for the department, when we compare that to what was provided at the draft position, we have a very small increase of 0.3 million. And this was as a result of the provision of 7.7 million of COVID funding and a reduction of 8 million for the tackling paramilitary activity, which has now been held centrally by DOF and some small technical transfers of 600,000. So over and above that 21-22 budget allocation, then as part of those in-year allocations, the department has been given £12.3 million. Pounds. This is all going to the PSNI. £9.8 million of that will enable the PSNI to retain their current police numbers, which sit approximately at 7,000. And then in addition to that, there is £2.5 million, which will allow them to begin to recruit approximately 100 officers towards the new decade, new approach commitments. When we attended the committee back on the 5th of November to discuss the information gathering exercise, the department showed inescapable pressures of 55.7 million. We have critically examined these and looked at ways in which we can manage them or reduce them. Previous cost estimates were revisited and areas where work could be slowed down were identified. Taking into account the budget allocation and ways to partly manage the remaining pressures, we still require approximately £20.4 million. Pounds. Of that, £14.5 million relates to the department, with £5.9 million relating to the PSNI. In addition to that £5.9 million for PSNI, they still have pressures on their EU exit of 5.7 million and 1.6 million for transformation. That brings the total pressures facing the department to a total of 27.7 million pounds. This excludes our COVID pressures. As I stated earlier, we were provided with 7.7 .7 million towards our COVID requirements but this still leaves us with a shortfall of 7.9 million. It is difficult, as you can appreciate, to have certainty on what is actually required for COVID over the period of this year, but we will continue to keep this under review and seek to reduce it where we can. Now moving to the 2021 update. Officials attended the committee on the 17th of December to discuss the 2021 financial year as part of the January monitoring round update. Following this, the department was then given the opportunity to notify the Department of Finance of further underspends in 2021. This was a separate exercise and in addition to the January monitoring round, which had already occurred. This gave the executive the opportunity to redistribute funding across the departments to ensure that all of the 2021 funding was spent. So as part of that exercise, the department returned 4.9 million of resource, of which 1.1 million was COVID, and 5.2 million of capital, 
which was then utilised by other departments. On our year-end accounts, just to give you an update that we are aiming to have our, um, our accounts ready for the summer recess, um, which is the deadline for laying the annual accounts um, and the report in the Assembly. As you're aware, last year we didn't manage to do that, but this year we are on track to do so. However, it will be subject to the completion of the audit, which may experience delays due to COVID. So in conclusion, I hope that I have provided you with a helpful overview of where we are at the start of this new financial year. Whilst things are starting to settle, there still remain significant uncertainties around COVID-19, which obviously makes managing our budget even more challenging. But we will continue to update the committee as the situation develops. So I thank you for the opportunity to provide you with this short overview, and we are very happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Deborah. That's been very helpful, and obviously, it's a challenging financial situation for the department. Um, in terms of how you're going to try and mitigate those pressures, the areas that you're you're looking at, um, there's some uh, information there in, in the papers around potential reduction in job numbers, prison service complement of officers. It indicates around 90. Um, and I'm, I'm keen just to explore with the other NDPBs, is there any prospect of job losses coming about or posts not being filled in order to help meet the shortfall in funding? Okay, well, maybe if I just say generally, um, you know, across the department, you know, vacancy management is really the only way that we can manage this in the short term. Um, so job losses, I don't think, is, is something that is on the agenda. Um, it's not ideal, but vacancy management will help contribute towards this. And that means that in certain areas of the business, some things will be slowed down um, or reprioritized. Um, I'll maybe let my colleagues just say a little bit, num um, a little bit more maybe about the impacts. Um, you mentioned specifically prisons there. Maybe ask Ron if you want to say a few words. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, I think it is a very challenging position for us. Um, I, I would want to say, though, at the beginning, we've not made any reductions. Um, we want to try and manage the shortfall in the prison's budget uh, through easements moving forward. Now, you know, I can't be complacent about this, and we do need to put plans in place for later in the year in case those easements uh, don't don't materialise. Um, I mean, around seventy percent of of prison service budget is made up in terms of staff and costs, um, and the other forty percent are pretty much inescapable pressures around. You know, non-staff costs. Um, you know, utilities, food costs, and things and things like that. So, what what I'm looking at at the moment is it's not it's not a case of anybody uh, losing their job, uh, but what we would do is we would stop recruitment later in the year. Um, now we're pretty much at the moment in the prison service at a full recruitment position. In other words, I'm only six operational staff short of what my operational target level should be. Um, so it would be about turning off recruitment um, in the autumn. You know, some of the other things that, that I'm looking at would be around the services that we can provide uh, to the people in our care. For example, you know, we could relocate um, our working out units uh, back into into the prisons, which would which would be a reduction in the staffing requirement. Um, you know, we could look at reducing learning and skills provision. Uh, we could look at closing down policy units. Uh, you know, every every one of those things will have uh, have an impact, um, and it would be a, a detrimental impact. But but at this point, what I'm saying to the committee is, we're we're not at that stage yet, but we are preparing in case we get there. Okay, thank you. Um, if I can bring in Linda at this stage, and then. Sinead and Gemma after that. Linda. Thank you, Chair. Just suppose there, there's a, a couple of issues and some of them have, have just been touched on there by Ronnie. I mean, the Chair's already asked and obviously always one of our main concerns will be is this going to lead to, to redundancy or um, staff reduction? And what, what Ronnie has just talked about is the potential of reduction in services within the prison, so whether it's a reduction in staff within the prison or whether it's a, a reduction within the, 
what is provided for prisoners, that, that will inevitably lead to a negative impact for both prisoners but for also for prison staff. Because the bottom line is, if, if prisoners are not able to avail of skills, and, and in the long term society, if they're not able to avail of skills that improve their chances whenever they come out of prison and rehabilitate fully and be able to come out and have opportunities whenever they come out, then that's a negative for everybody. It's a negative for the prisoner, it's a negative for the prison service, and it's a negative for the society as a whole. That then follows on in terms of problem solving. I mean, if there's not going to be investment, or, and it looks like there is going to be a reduction in investment into problem solving justice. And if we're not having that, then inevitably you're going to end up with more people in the prison service, but potentially with less staff and less services. And again, then around probation services and probation, we did see what I would say was um, a very concerning paper from the probation board and a number of weeks ago in the committee around the potential for what they will be able to offer in terms of services and frontline services. And again, there's an impact there for the prisoners. There's an impact for the prison service because people potentially will end up back in prison. And there's an impact for society as a whole. So I think sometimes, you know, as a department, we're looking to short-term savings, but they, they, they lead to long-term costs. And this is coming out of the system somewhere. We are not saving anything here. We, you know, there is no reduction in what's going out. It, it may be a different place that it's going out of, but for the most part, it may well still be the same place it's coming out of because these people are ending up back in prison. And we all know the high cost of keeping somebody in jail. The just in, in another part of the papers, I seen that the the minister is also stalling the rollout of the ECOs, and that's in order to prevent people from having to go into prison for short term. Again, additional cost of having the people in prison, additional pressure on, on the services and additional pressure on the staff. And if we're talking about a potentially reduced staff, and I hope um, we're not, but if we are, then th this for me just says that we are actually going backwards in terms of our, our prison service and our rehabilitation for prisoners. And again, I'll say it again, that has an impact on society as a whole. We all suffer if prisoners are not properly rehabilitated or if we don't put the proper investment into problem solving justice to prevent them from getting to the point where they end up in prison in the first place. We all suffer because of that. That's not just the prisoner and their family and those who have to deal with them in the prison and probation service. Everybody pays the price. Could I maybe just comment on the PBNI issue that was raised just to give a little bit of assurance that there has been some additional money given. Um, so there, all of the COVID costs have been met um, that PBNI needed. So it was 400,000 out of the 7.7. .7. That meets their COVID requirements in full. Um, and they, as part of the Tackling Paramilitary Programme and the funding that's been allocated out, they're, they are getting what they require um, of 1.6 million um, for their Aspire and Engage programme. So those things um, have, have been addressed. Okay, that, that, I mean, that, that answers part of it, but there's a, there's a much, much bigger issue. Well, one of the other issues that the probation board also raised was that their social workers are paid um, much less than, than social workers within the, the trusts, for example. And, I mean, could justice and health not work together in relation to social workers and how they would they would fund them and ensure that there isn't disparity there? What 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 an, you know what would entice you to be a social worker within the probation service if you know that you'll be able to get more money if you work in one of the trusts? That would be a concern. I'm sure there's quite a high staff turnover if that's the case as well because you may work there for a short period, but eventually you're going to want to go where you're going to be paid more for the same job. So, so it's helpful I can come in on that. Um, there's a couple of issues in there. The, the first is to do with yeah, comparative pay scales in recruitment and retention. Um, the second is to do with um, a pay remit fitting within the overall um, public sector pay policy. Um, we are working on both. Um, and actually, um, we have been very supportive of probation's argument that these are specialist workers and that recruitment and retention in particular um, it is, is a really important consideration in their case. Um, so that, that argument has been made and it has now progressed to the Department of Finance. So 
we are very keen to resolve that. But the overall context is public sector pay policy. So we need to work on the very particular detail around that specialism and why recruitment and retention is important. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. And if I can bring in Sinead Bradley, and then Linda's just going to take over, Chair, and I just need to nip out for a few minutes, so hopefully I'll be able to come back shortly, but um, Sinead, and then I'll hand over. Yes, Chair, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Thank you, and um, thanks for the presentation so far. Um, th there's plenty in it, and I suppose it's it's more about what's, what's not here, you know, that the budget just isn't covering some of the very basic things and that, and that is worrying and in that I note the Gillen review it was disappointing saying that the bid wasn't met and that a certain amount has been I think 2.4 million prioritised from the department's baseline towards Gillen and I'm just wondering how far will that actually go because a lot of the work that the committee are focusing on at the, min at the moment and for the remainder of this mandate um, the Gillen review really does bet heavily on that, and I, I'm just not convinced that that sum is going to to travel too far into that. So, I'd like maybe an idea of how compromised you think the Gillen review and the ambition of fulfilling it is based on this budget. But also another point I'd like to pick up on: in September 2020, um, the department was seeking 1.1.5 1. 1. million. I think it was for the tackling paramilitarism and now I see that that money uh, so that, that was money that the department were seeking but I see that the larger sum the 8 million has been then taken in centrally because of it being a cross cutting um, project but I wonder then in terms of the department reaching into that but again what was that 1.115 million and is that expected to come back out into the department of justice and I know you mentioned the probation board there they may be part of that and a third point if I could um, just bring it up the trouble uh, troubles permanent disablement scheme I note that the money, you know, the infrastructure for the scheme, but the actual money for paying out um, to those who apply to it isn't there. But there is that commitment, obviously, following a court case, that the um, that you know applicants to the scheme who are eligible will be paid. But I'm just wondering, in terms of the Department for Justice's uh, financing, do you anticipate or have you been put on standby in year? to manage anything of that just to get and I'm trying to get an idea of the timeline of when um, applicants can expect to be paid and if the Department of Justice will have a role in the actual payment and um, so do you anticipate having to revisit this in a year? Thank you. So I'll work backwards then, if that's okay. So um, on the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme, so um, on Tuesday the President announced that the scheme would open for applications um, by the 30th of June. Um, the issue of when payments will be paid, of course, is quite complex because it will depend on the complexity of each individual case, and that will be an issue that will be considered by the Victims Payment Board. With regard to the availability of funding, um, we will make our requirements to TU, who will be who will then need to make the provision back to the department. Um, if TU do not have that funding, they will go to DOF, and that will need to be considered by the wider executive. Um, as you know, the commitment has been made that the funding will be made available. The question at the moment is, of course, still where will the funding come from? Um, and they're still seeking further um, engagement with the Secretary of State. There have been previous meetings between the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, Finance Minister and the Justice Minister on this, um, and we continue to pursue that. Um, so that's the position at the moment. There will be no expectation that this would come out of the DOJ budget. Um, but of course, if there is an issue about what needs to be found from the executive, there will be an implication for all departments' budgets um, across um, the whole nine departments, presumably. Um, I think that was all of the questions that you asked on the TP. Um, was there anything on the ta Troubles Permanent Stable Payment Scheme I missed there? No, that's fine. It was just to know that, that um, they roll off the department in terms of that you are a, you are a player in the actual yeah. payment. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. payment won't be coming direct from, 
finance or TA or it will the department will be issuing the payment. So you would hold at some point that budget. We don't hold the budget, no. Um, the budget sits with TEO, so we invoice TEO, we bill them. It doesn't go anywhere near our budget okay. score at all. Um, so, th so if that's of any comfort to you, but... Yeah, no, yeah. no it's just to know whether to anticipate it coming through the department or not. No, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on, on the Gillen, um, you know, from, a, from a financial point of view, um, originally the... the it was envisaged that the funding would be phased or the program would be phased over three years but because of covid then that was revisited and now it looks like it'll be delivered over a five-year period so the amount that's um allocated the department has carved out specifically the 2.4 million is um deemed to be sufficient um to meet the requirements in the current financial year and um, with a requirement of approximately 10 million over the five years um we're on target within Gillen to deliver what we planned this year and the 2.4 million should do that, including the remote evidence centres that we plan. We have two temporary ones running at the moment, one in Belfast and one in Craigavon. And we'll put one in Belfast City Centre on a permanent basis at Queen's Court. And that'll go hopefully through in this year. And we've allocated an amount of capital towards that. There's a slight shortfall, but I'm hoping to take that from the court services budget if there's a real problem if we don't get it from other sources and we'll use that so i don't envisage that there will be any significant delay or shortfall in what we have planned to do this year within gillen but as deborah has pointed out when we originally started gillen we thought about a three-year time frame mm. but that was before we actually dug into how long it would actually take to change systems processes training people at a five-year time frame is actually much more realistic in terms of what we could do even if all of the money was available but we have 10 million to cover it over that that time frame and i think we should be on track to deliver within that time frame okay um and then on tackling permanent <laughs> <laughs> um, i scribble that down um i i think i think the 1.1 million um was probably for the the core team and and for running the program and i imagine that wouldn't have been confirmed the last time the team was with you. Um, but but subsequent to that, I've just I've just scribbled down um, the, the full picture on that. Um, and and you're right because it's a cross executive program. It it, it sits in Department of Finance, and, and the bits that show in our budget are the bits that we're directly responsible for. So in terms of the overall package, um, the executive agreed. I think back in July. Um, Eight million per year for three years, subject to Treasury matching that. And the match this year came in the form of, of five million from Treasury, which went into the, the programme and ten over three years out of NDNA. So it's a slightly complicated mix there. In terms of the justice pieces, um, about 1.2 of that is in the kind of run, running the programme and actually some commitments in relation to monitoring the offenders, um, some work that NIPS is doing in relation to um, learning and wellbeing outcomes for people. Um, Community Safety and Paramilitary Crime Task Force at about 5.9 million. And then um, picking up on Linda's point, Aspire and Engage about 1.6 million. So there's around nine that then essentially comes back to us in here, which is the justice related stuff. Um, but in terms of the concern around that gap, that, that has been resolved for this year. Um, obviously we'll now need to bid for next year again. Okay, and would it be fair to say that that, that um, one million or just over that that goes into the department is would that be the pace in terms of monitoring the success of these programs? You know, is that is that so where that, that would be held? That, that, yeah, that's that's part of it. It's obviously more than that. It, it's, yeah. it's all of the funds and stakeholder engagement. The, there's a lot of individual program evaluation, and that's that kind of. It is a cross departmental team that's hosted here. Um, so, you know, we do try and support the cross departmental working around that. But yes, that's that's essentially the sort of engine room of the programme. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair, if you're back. OK, Gemma, Dolan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. I was having technical difficulties at the start, so I missed a bit of your presentation, so I'm sorry if this had already been addressed. But in our table papers, it says um, 
that there might be an introduction of new court fees for services which are or will be provided but are not charged for in an attempt to kind of make money back. What sort of services are these? <laughs> There's a range of services that we currently charge for and we would be having a look at the rates of those. There's other things that we do that we could possibly charge for. I don't have a list of them with me today because we haven't actually begun to identify what we might consider charging for. And even if we did, there would be a change of legislation, secondary legislation, to bring those into that field. Any charges that we intended to levy, we would, of course, bring to yourselves, letting the committee know what the plan would be. But to be honest, every organisation within the civil service at the moment is being asked to look at income generation and ways of dealing with uh, the financial pressure. So we're having to look at that. So it's a process we're beginning at the moment, but I don't have a list for you at this point. Okay, that's grand, but it will be coming to the committee anyway before any changes are made. So, yes, that's okay. Thank you. That's me, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Gemma. Rachel Woods. Thank you, um, Vice Chair, and thank you for all coming here today and your detailed reports and engagement with the committee on this. I know we've had a number of brief impacts from you, and they're incredibly detailed. And I appreciate that we are not in a great place in terms of the budget. Um, and Sinead covered a question I wanted to ask about Gillen and Gemma on the court fees, but just on the court fee, the potential of, of additional fees being charged, certainly I would welcome a list of, of what um, the thinking is on that. And just to confirm, that would require a public consultation as well, um, if it was going through secondary legislation, or would that be something that would, would just be passed by the department? It depends on what actual ideas we come up with. Some might need consultation and others would be already within the legislation that we would be allowed to do that. But as I say, that's we're at the very beginning of that process. We haven't started it, so I don't have a list of possibilities at this point. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Um, Ronnie, and you'd mentioned sort of long term plans then on the, you know, and, and, and looking at uh, scoping, you know, the impact of halting of recruitment. I appreciate, you know, with six staff short at the moment. Um, and then also mentioned about learning and skills. And like Linda, I would have concerns about that ever being cut. In fact, I would probably want to do more, you know, in terms of rehabilitation um, within the prisons um, and, and, and ensuring adequate learning and skills are, are there. But um, I suppose just in terms of uh, like the, the whole of the civil service, so in terms of if, if, there, if there was any cutting of recruitment or further halting of recruitment, um, there would be an impact on staff and, and, and workload and mental health and everything else that we've all come to know um, slightly more personally um, over the pandemic and the effects of working at home and the offices and so on. Um, and would that then be communicated with the unions as well as the staff if there was going to be halting on recruitment and any impacts coming forward from, from union reps? Um, I mean, absolutely. Uh, but but I do want to stress, uh, you know, we're, we're not at that position or near that position yet. Um, we we are still working at the moment on developing a recruitment campaign that would go out in the autumn. Uh, now, if our financial position remained unchanged, um, we we may have to delay that. Uh, we are in a really good position at the moment in that we have uh, pretty much full staffing level. There are some grades that are short, others have a surplus, but it, but it balances out for us. Um, and we don't have a lot of people actually leaving the service at the minute. Uh, but switching off the recruitment hub is a, an option for us that would certainly help us over a period of time bring the staff cost down. But, but you're absolutely right, and, and Linda Dillon was absolutely right in saying that you know prisons operate most effectively when you have an appropriate number of staff or prisoner, uh, and when you have appropriate activities for prisoners to be engaged in. So, so any reduction in one or the other uh, will have a detrimental impact. And, and what I would want to say to the committee is we would want to do everything we possibly could mm -hmm. to try and avoid that. Now, we've just signed, I've just signed a new service level agreement on learning and skills, uh, and we're really excited about that. I think we can, we, we can do some really, really good work, uh, but you know, I, I have to plan for a worst case scenario 
And all I'm saying to the committee today is that's where the thinking would be on those range of subjects that I mentioned. Uh, but we will do everything we can to avoid that. Thank you, Ronnie. I no, appreciate that. Certainly one to um, keep our eye on, for sure. Um, and, and Ronnie, it's free. I'm not picking on you at all. Um, it's just been mentioned, the ECOs. Um, just, and I've put you on the spot. In terms of short presence day, let's say a week, or even if, a, a night, how much does that cost? Do you, would you have that to hand? Well, I don't, I don't have that um, to hand. What, what I can say to you is a couple of things. First of all, in 2010, the cost per prisoner place was 73,000. Uh, in the year that we've just completed, it was 43,000. So we have drastically reduced our cost per prisoner place. Now, when you're, when you're talking about ECOs, um, I think the cost of an ECO is around uh, 13,000. I think that's roughly, a, Julie, I'll correct me if I'm wrong. We estimate on the University of Ulster estimated that the cost of a short prison sentence is around three to 4,000. So I, I can't give you the figure of what it is per night or, you know, because short prison sentences vary, um, but the average cost would be around three to three and a half thousand for a short prison sentence. Thank you, Ronnie. No, good to know. Um, and finally for you, um, again, not picking on you, but um, I have had some representations made to me with regard to the pay of prison officers. Um, and I suppose this goes, it was touched upon earlier on with regard to the pay policy, which has been mentioned. Is there an ongoing discussion with unions on pay or is this something wholly set and involved with by the Department of Finance? No, um, we have our own pay remit, which needs the approval of the Department of Finance. And as you may recall, prison service works through the uh, pay review body. Uh, so they, they look at our, our structures. I, I have invited the POA in to have a conversation about pay and I've asked them to, uh, to make their, their, their initial bid to me for this incoming year. Uh, up to this point, they've, they've declined to do that. Uh, but, but the door is open to have those uh, to have those conversations, and I'm keen that the POA would come in, that they would submit their bid, uh, and we would start work. The pay review body will, of course, have to come in as well, um, and, and we will we will take that forward. Okay, thank you. Um, and not for Ronnie, but just uh, in <laughs> in general, in terms of the equality screening of the final budget position, when will this be happening? So we did do our quality screening um, on the, the draft budget um, and it was uh, um, there were minimal uh, impacts across the section 75 groups and um, so it was screened out and we're now just updating that in light of the final budget allocation so I would like to get that out probably in the next week or so. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much Chair. That's all from me and sorry Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you, Ronnie. And that, that has raised a few, a few um, issues in my head, even in terms of the questions just asked by Rachel and, and how we probably do need to have a bit of a focus on who and what type of offences are, are people ending up in those short stays in prison for, because we really do have to look at, is, is that the right way to deal with it in, in a lot of cases? With Doug Beatty, is Doug there? Yes, yes I am. Um, Chair, thank you very much. Um, Ronnie, I'm sorry. Um, listen, uh, do you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense, I'm trying to get a sense of this, uh, and I know uh, how difficult things are for the prison service, and, and every time the prison service budget is cut, and it seems to be an easy one to cut, um, staffing levels do go down in some way or another, and I know you're saying you're, you're very close to full manning, only six short. But give us a sense of that six short in effect to how many people you have off um, sick at this moment in time, it, it, which would be classed as long-term um, sick. And, and could you give us a sense, a genuine sense, uh, of, of how you think that if you cancelled the recruitment campaign, that would impact on your numbers in the medium to, to long-term? Okay, um, well, it might be helpful just to, to give you a little bit of context uh, to this. I mean, the, pr the prison service is funded at the moment for 1,450 prisoners. 
Um, today, the current population is 1,392. So we are a little bit below what our, our sort of our funding level is. Now, in terms of our operational staffing level, um, funded for 1,400 prisoners, 1,450 prisoners, means that our operational staffing level is 1,149, and we currently have 1,143. So that's how we, so that's how we get the how we get the six. You asked me about our, our sick absence level. Um, I mean, the sick absence level in, in prison service, uh, as you will know, has been consistently high. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting overall today with around 100 officers who are absent uh, in terms of sick absence. I don't, I don't have the exact number in terms of, of the long term people, but I can certainly, certainly get that for you. Um, there has been a delay because of COVID in, in I think, managing sick absence in that um, normally what we would be doing is having face-to-face -face interviews with people. Um, and it's very difficult to do that at the moment. Um, and a lot of people do not feel comfortable having their sick absence interview uh, done virtually in, in the way we're meeting today. So so that is that is creating a bit of a pressure. Uh, but we're working with our HR colleagues to try uh, to try and address that. So, you know, what what I'm saying about recruitment is uh, when I took this job four years ago, we were we were sitting at around 130 officers short. Um, and one one of the commitments I made at that stage was that we would bring we would sort our <laughs> staffing levels and get them to the appropriate the appropriate point, and we would maintain that. Um, and that's where we that's where we are at the minute. Now it's taken us the best part of four years to get there. Um, but if we found in the autumn that we simply didn't have the funding, uh, then I, I I would have no alternative but to delay the recruitment campaign. Now that wouldn't have an immediate impact, but it certainly would have an impact over a period of time if we couldn't if we couldn't address it. So. You know, one of, one of the things I will want to do, and we're managing our our budget very, very carefully at the moment, um, to, to try and avoid being in that being in that position. Because I think if you go back to, you know, some of the damning prison reports of 2015-16, you know, you, you will see very clearly that the cause of that in, in some ways was because we didn't have a, a staff to prisoner ratio right. So, you know, I don't think any of us haven't come through, all we've come through and what Prisons 2020 has delivered for us, we'd, we'd want to go back there. So, so we will do everything we can to avoid that. Uh, and I know you do, Ronnie. I know you work really hard on this, and I know I, I, I you, well, I haven't in a while, but we engage about this quite, quite, quite a lot. And it's always one of my bugbears about, about staffing levels. And I absolutely get the problem that you've got in regards to those who are long term sick, and, and but it's, I mean, this is all that funding related, as far as I'm concerned, because I, I, I get a sense, Ronnie, that the resilience you've got in your prison service with your staff is because the prison population is lower than what it would be, what it's what it's set at. But if that prison population, for example, through unrest, civil unrest, through whatever's going on, was to suddenly b blossom and increase quite a lot. Would we have a problem with the resilience within your staff level numbers? Well, I think I think there are a couple of points I, I would I would want to make. I mean, we you know we're probably about fifty to sixty prisoners below what we're funded for. Um, but the thing we have at the moment is, as a result of COVID and in the context of the COVID funding that we've received, we have every prisoner in a single cell. Uh, and I, you know that's the first time. That has, that has happened, certainly, that I can ever remember. Um, and, and that's been a cornerstone of the prison service's success in managing the COVID pandemic uh, that has been so devastating in prison services across the rest of the, the rest of the UK. So because we have everybody in a single cell, it means that we have a greater footprint and therefore we're deploying our staff in a different way and we are heavily relying on overtime that COVID funding is uh, providing for us. So to answer your question, yes, if there was a sudden spike in the prison population, 
that would undoubtedly be challenging for us to, to manage. And it may be at that stage that I would be saying, uh, look, I, I can no longer afford single cell occupancy. We need to we need to start sort of, you know, bringing things back in again. And um, so there are ways of managing it, um, but but none of it's easy. And uh, you know, there are there are risks associated with everything you do in, in a prison context. But those risks are made much greater at the moment because of COVID. Uh, and, and really good for answer, Ronnie. No issue with that. I guess the whole point. I'll just leave it here. Is is you know I really think that the recruitment process really needs to be that last piece of yard that you cut. You know, um, and that you know the the justice minister really does need to find funding for that recruitment. You know, um, somewhere because I think it's very important. And I've seen it before where organisations have been on a level and and you know all of a sudden they start reducing guys and it's hard to get them back up to that level again and you said so yourself just to get yourself up from being 130 short to being just six short has taken you quite quite some time can i just finish off with one question ronnie again with yourself the review of support services for for northern Ireland prison service operational staff report that came out in january um, and also for the retired staff can you just confirm that the recommendations within that are not going to be affected by the funding if any of them are resource heavy? Um, I, I can confirm that we are working to implement those two reports in, in full um, and I'm chairing a programme board to do that. We, we are in some fairly detailed discussions with service providers around some of the support uh, mechanisms that are required uh, and we're developing the business case for that. Um, I mean, I'm due to update the committee in, in June as to where we are, but I can say to you at the minute we're making good progress, but we will have to bid for that funding separately. It, it's not something that we could meet within our existing resources, but, but as you know, the Minister is very committed to, to this work, um, and along with yourself and a number of others have been uh, at the forefront of, of driving this forward. So that, that's where we are at the moment, and I'll certainly uh, I'll certainly keep the committee um, updated in terms of progress. Your start, Ronnie. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Doug. Nobody else has indicated. Paul, were you looking in or are you OK? No, no, I'm OK, Linda. Thank you. OK, th thank you. Um, just a, a last final couple of questions, probably for yourself, Deborah. Just in terms of... Um, funding that's held centrally within the department. How much is that? And that this is for allocation within year, and how are those allocations prioritised? And has the minister been required to issue any ministerial directions in relation to COVID-19 expenditure? Um, so the, the funding that is held centrally is for those specific um, areas of, of you know, Gillen um, and Legacy, which we will then allocate out. So there's no other funding as such. Um, obviously, we are still looking at a situation where we've got all these significant pressures. So as and when easements arise, we will prioritise those easements against those pressures in the first instance, which hopefully will help to mitigate some of those issues that we've talked around staffing, etc., and minimise the impact. Um, so that's the position at the moment which we will keep under continual review so that we don't need to take any further action at this point but of course the challenge here is that this is a one-year budget um, and we have to be very careful about commitments that we enter into in this financial year which will then create the commitments and um, future potential pressures um, in the further years to follow so it's something we're just going to have to keep under continual review okay thank you and then has the minister been required to issue any ministerial directions in relation to COVID-19 expenditure? No. She hasn't? No, no. Okay, sorry. I don't know if it's my hearing or the sound. Um, apologies for that. Listen, no other members have indicated then. Thank you to the officials for, for presenting to us today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. To all of you. Appreciate it. Okay, members, the Committee for Finance intends to coordinate responses from the statutory committees on the final budget 21-22, and these must be submitted by Friday the 28th of May. 
and <coughs> excuse me, will most likely be published on the committee's web page. Can I just get the, the views of members on, on issues and areas that you wish covered in relation to the committee's response in the department's final budget to enable a draft response to be prepared for consideration and agreement by the committee in advance of its submission to the committee for finance? Rachel. Thanks, Chair. No, it's certainly, um, I think, just reflecting all of our comments with regard to staffing levels and pressures on existing staff, be it in the civil service, um, in DOJ, or across the um, prison service or any other NDP, um, and just the effects that that could have and, and what that could mean, uh, especially later on in the year, um, and particularly. Uh, something that maybe just need to pick up in future on is, is the costs of ACOs versus costs of prisoner places and short-term prison stays. Um, I think there's a bit of a ballot rebalance in there needing to be done. Um, but that, that's the two, and, and, and of course the learning and skills that we both mentioned there in terms of um, prison and the uh, impact of budget have on that. Um, but that, that's all for me. Thank you, Rachel, and, and I would support the, the issues that you've outlined, Rachel, and just to add in, in terms of problem solving and restorative justice and, and concerns around that, but that, that, that's already been highlighted, so okay. just to, to add that in. No other members have indicated? Christine, no? Chair? Junaid, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, Chair, yeah. just to add to that. Um, you know, I have concerns also about, you know, the body of work that we're doing as a committee in terms of the legislation we're bringing forward. And I feel to see how it won't have some financial effect. A lot of it is um, deliverable via the Gillen Review or variants of the Gillen Review. And I, I just don't see that there's sufficient funds in year in any year to seriously tackle that. And I, I just would be um, concerned going forward that the, the scope's not there to really put some teeth into the legislation that we're passing. Um, so I just think it should be noted and that any bids, I suppose, from the department going forward would reflect the need to amplify the legislation that's coming through. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Um, Members, if you're happy enough, what we will do is we'll review the Hansard and we'll include all the issues that were raised um, and the questions that were raised during the oral evidence session. We can draft, um, uh, a, we can prepare a draft response on covering all of those. And if there are any other issues you want covered, if you want to email us, we'll, we'll send out an email reminder. Um, and then we can prepare a draft response covering all of those issues for consideration at a future meeting, if that's okay. Okay, I appreciate that, Christine. Thank you. Members, we'll move on to agenda item five then, the new three-year victims and witness strategy and establishment of a victims of crime commissioner proposed on the proposed consultation. Members, the departmental officials will attend the meeting via Starleaf to outline proposals to consult on a new three-year victims and witnesses strategy and for the establishment of the Victims of Crime Commissioner. The relevant papers are at pages 254 to 454 of your meeting pack. And I think we're going to welcome the officials on uh, Starleaf. And we have Julie Wilson, Deputy Director of the Victims Support and Judicial Policy Division, and Leslie Cowan and Liz Semple from the Victims and Witnesses Branch, Department of Justice. <coughs> I think we have you. Yeah, we're here. Yeah, Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. My hearing wasn't very good the last time, so <laughs> apologies. <laughs> I, hope I can hear you a bit better. Um, just to advise you, the session will be reported by Hansard and the transcript will be published on the committee webpage. Um, thank you to all of you for attending today. And Julie, I think you're going to outline the consultation uh, proposals for the new three year yeah. victims and witnesses strategy and the establishment of the Victims of Crime Commissioner. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, we're really grateful for this opportunity to brief the committee on the draft consultation on two related sets of proposals for victims and witnesses. As committee members will be aware, in addition to the impact of crime itself on victims and witnesses, the actual process of engaging with the criminal justice system can also be daunting. So collectively, these proposals, first for a new victim and witness strategy, and then also for the establishment of a victims of crime commissioner, are intended to improve the experiences of victims and witnesses in the criminal justice system. As members will be aware, there's already a range of measures in place to support victims and witnesses, many of which are enshrined under the charters. However, we also know from recent reviews and from survey responses and from engagement with victims and witnesses that the system does not always best, best meet their needs and interests. The proposals within the draft strategy seek to build on and enhance existing provisions, but they also seek to ensure consistent delivery of our charter obligations. The strategy has been developed in partnership with criminal justice agencies and victim support services and it seeks to address a number of overarching themes which have been highlighted in recent inspections and surveys. And these include that victim and witness interests need to be embedded into our strategic planning, our policies and our operational practices, that there is a need for greater awareness of entitlements under the charters, that a culture shift is also needed across criminal justice organisations, and that victims and witnesses need access to timely, accurate and case-specific information. So the draft strategy builds on our earlier, um, our earlier action plan to implement CIGINI recommendations, but it also takes account of wider strategies and work programmes. So turning to the strategic framework, we've proposed an aim of supporting victims and witnesses and improving their experience of the criminal justice system. And the programme of work that is set out in the draft strategy is intended to achieve this aim within its uh, three year lifespan. But we've also identified an aspirational mission statement that victims and witnesses should be at the centre of the criminal justice system. And we recognise that this is unlikely to be fully achieved within the three years, but the intention is that the draft strategy and delivery of that strategy should move us closer to that point. We've focused the proposed objectives and associated actions around four strategic priorities, and these are developing an improved understanding of the needs, interests and experiences of victims and witnesses, ensuring that they receive the emotional and practical support that they need, embedding increased organisational focus on victims and witnesses, and ensuring that they receive the services and information that they need and are entitled to. So our consultation is seeking views on whether these are the right priorities that we should be focused on, whether the um, objectives and actions are likely to deliver against these priorities, and on any gaps um, perceived within the strategy. We recognise the need for improved communication and for an effective and joined up system. And that's why partnership has been identified as an underpinning principle to support the delivery of the strategy. Our second set of proposals then relates to the establishment of a Victims of Crime Commissioner for Northern Ireland. And this is a key commitment under the draft strategy. Um, members will recall that the Minister advised uh, the Assembly in October of her plans to establish a reference group of representatives from victim stakeholder organisations to advise and inform her thinking around the role and the remit of a Victims of Crime Commissioner. That reference group met on three occasions and discussed a range of issues. Um, they provided advice to the Minister in December and they also then met with her in January of this year. So having considered um, the advice that she's received, the Minister believes that a Victims of Crime Commissioner would add value to existing provision and would be a positive step forward, providing a voice for all victims, promoting best practice and driving improved outcomes and experiences for victims within the criminal justice system. Our consultation is seeking views on a range of proposals in relation to the, the proposed commissioner. Um, we're proposing that the role and functions of a commissioner should be to provide a voice for all victims, to identify, promote, encourage, and issue guidance on good practice, to review the adequacy and effectiveness of law and practice, to review the operation and delivery of charter entitlements, to direct complaints and monitor the outcomes from these complaints, to advise and make recommendations 
and to undertake or commission research. The reference group agreed that a commissioner should represent all victims of crime. However, we also acknowledge that certain groups or types of victims are likely to have specific needs. And so we're also proposing that the remit and focus of the proposed commissioner should be not just to represent all victims of crime, but, but should also include a particular focus on victims of domestic and sexual abuse and victims of hate crime. Um, and then in addition to that, we're also proposing that the commissioner should be independent of gov government and as such, they would have, um, they would be free to identify their own additional priorities set out in a strategic plan. As you know, we're not in a position to legislate, to put the commissioner on a statutory footing within this mandate. So we're consulting on the establishment of a non-statutory commissioner designate. But we think that this is an important role, not just in representing and championing victims, but also in helping to shape the development of that future statutory commissioner role. Um, finally, we've also proposed that the commissioner should be required to establish an advisory panel and we're keen to hear the views of consultees on how this might best be achieved. In terms of the consultation, um, subject to committee's views, we uh, would hope to launch the consultation on the 6th of May for 12 weeks. Uh, we're planning to use citizen space site um, mainly because this is uh, very easily accessible but we're also going to supplement that with other means and we'll be promoting it widely on social media. We're also in discussion with Victim Support NI and with NSPCC about arranging focus groups to take, um, to take views of the people that they support on the, the, the consultation. Um, and we'll be, we plan to consider responses over the summer um, with a view to presenting a proposed way forward after the summer recess. So just in summing up, um, we have listened carefully to the voices of victims and witnesses and we have heard what Sajini and others have told us. We know that there are significant and systemic changes that are required and um, which we're now seeking to deliver through the draft strategy with further service improvement anticipated under the role of the proposed commissioner. Um, I hope this has been a helpful overview and we're happy to answer any questions that the committee might have. Thank you very much for, for the, the brief, Julie. If, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with the, the um, victims of, of crimes commissioner just is is there an, are there any provisions in the 2021-22 budget in relation to that and if there are what are the costings that the department have undertaken in relation to the establishment of the victims of crimes commissioner uh, we have um, we've, we've estimated and at this point it is a, a high level estimate um, and it would need to be informed by the outcome of the um, the outcome of the consultation and further options appraisals and business case. But we're estimating that the annual running costs would be in and around uh, 600, just under 650,000. Um, but within this financial year, we're anticipating uh, a need for around 100,000, and those would be to, uh, to to set up the office and have a commissioner in, in post. Um, before the end of his mandate. So uh, we, we would be able to meet that cost currently from within um, within our divisional budget. I'm just wondering then also how the Minister proposes to undertake the appointment process for the interim Victims of Crime Commissioner designate. I mean, I'm just, for me, I'm looking at it time wise. A consultation is going to take place, which is going to last for 12 weeks launched in May, that takes us up to September. If you were to open a public appointments process, that will take a number of months. I, mean, I think we're running into an election on the, the end of this mandate and the minister potentially um, passing something like this on in relation to a victims commissioner without any legislative basis um, to, another, to a new minister. I'm just wondering, is, is that the most appropriate way to go forward and maybe maybe it's a different process so I'm just trying to establish that if you can give me some idea on that Julie please. I think the, the timing is very tight on this um, we are because it won't be a, this won't be a statutory uh, a, a statutory role uh, we are 
following the Sapani code, but it, it, it won't be a regulated uh, public appointment. Uh, so we are, we, but we will be following their code of practice and we're engaging with Sapani at, at, at this point in time to inform that process. Um, the, we anticipate that the, the, the consultation should close um, at the end of July and then we'll take um, August to be looking at consultation responses and uh, and finalising uh, the, the proposals and we, we would intend to bring those back to the committee in September. But as we're doing that, we're also working with Sapani on what we can, what preparations we can make at this stage. Um, obviously, they will also need to be informed by the outcome of consultation, but we're doing as much preparation as we can uh, throughout the summer so that we would be in a position to move quite quickly on the appointments process. Okay, Julie, just two things. T to go back, I, I thought we, that you had said that the consultation process would be 12 weeks beginning in May, so I don't know how it closes in July, but maybe I'm, if it's at the very start of May, is that May, June, the whole of July? Maybe. Um, um, and then just, is has there been any thinking around whether the interim commissioner designate would be excluded from being able to apply for the post should it become statute in the in the new mandate. I know, for example, in terms of the HIA interim commissioner, it was a very specific condition of, of the individual who would take up the post of interim commissioner could not apply for the for the permanent post, obviously because there, there would be some fear that there could be seen to be um, you know, it, it could work to their favour the fact that they have been the interim commissioner, and and understandably so, it would seem silly to change that person if they were perf doing a perfectly good job, but that may not comply fully with how we should be doing things in an open and transparent way for in, uh, recruitment. Well, we are we're working through the through this kind of issues at, at the minute, and I think um, certainly. Um, the role that we would anticipate for an interim designate commissioner in helping to inform how the develop how, how the statutory role is developed, um, our, our sense at this stage is that 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 they wouldn't be able to be appointed appointed to that statutory role. So that, um, uh, but we are working through to get a final position on that. But that's that is our current thinking is that that they would be ruled out from the statutory. Uh, commissioner role. Okay. Um, and, and as I say again, I am a wee bit concerned about that timeline around the consultation period because even if you were saying the whole of May, June, July was taken in the 12 weeks, it's closing at the very end of July at the earliest. And then obviously there's a period of time where you look at the consultation responses. Um, so I'm, I'm I suppose I'm just flagging up my concern around that. I don't expect you to. You've already answered it. To be fair, and don't expect you to answer it again. Um, we have a couple of members just looking to ask questions. Gemma Dolan. Gemma can be brought into the spotlight. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. I have three questions, so I'm just going to give them to you as one at a time. Um, the first question is. The consultation contains a number of important actions to be delivered within the three-year lifespan of the strategy, but are there any target dates within each year for the specific actions? I know Annex B contains annual targets, but would there be maybe would it be possible maybe to get quarterly targets um, shown to us? I think. Uh for some pieces of work and for some actions, we will have those quarterly targets, and for others, we still need to do some development work on that. So I think some of that information is is we have, and some of it we haven't quite developed yet. Um, we would intend to. I mean, what we've done is try to to show, like you say, the what the annual uh, targets and what we'll be delivering within a, a given year. But we would want to. Um, then further develop um, a, a supporting action plan. Some of the, the targets um, are driven by commitments in, for example, the Sejini action plan, where we have very, you know, we have set out targets, but we just haven't, at this point, um, we haven't 
reflected them across within the strategy because we've just tried to keep it at that at, at that higher level and particularly for the consultation uh, we, we wanted to, to to give a sense of the flow of work over the three years but without um, without putting too much detail into into what is already quite a, a big consultation paper but but that will be a piece of work that we'll be developing you know to, to ensure that we have those uh, project plans in place with target dates identified where they're not already identified okay thank you um they'd, they'd be welcome to be honest um my next question is how much of the strategy will be resource dependent you know will it be a case of reallocating resources or will additional resources be required you know obviously with the budgetary constraints it would be a bit of concern if there were additional resources required so in some cases um there there is funding in place and others we will need to do business cases and work out what the costings will be um so um you know so there you know there there are a number of, of actions that are already well underway that are reflected in the strategy and and in those cases we know what the costs are we've done that that work there are other pieces of of work where there's further work needed to, to kind of tease out what those costs might be and to and also to do the supporting business case to do look at options um and 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 look at matters of affordability so and, and those questions of affordability i think will will have to inform how some of those actions are developed okay so it might actually be impacted um because of the budgetary situation I think what what we're saying is what's in the what is in the strategy we intend to do, um, um, you know, but the nature of the final model may be impacted by um, issues of affordability, or we may need to bid for additional funding in order to to deliver things. Um, certainly, we have a certain amount of funding which has been allocated for so a number of the the actions under the under the strategy are. Our commitments under Gillen, um, and you know, we'll be taking those forward with uh, with, with money that has been allocated towards uh, for, for Gillen. There may be additional um, work needed to um, as, as to identify further resource implications. So, for example, work on the support for children's uh, work stream under Gillen. Um, we're we're still at the point where where. For some of those, we need to do the costings, and and we'll need to look at options and look at you know um, how work is developed in line with what our resources are. Okay, that's fair enough. And um, my third and final question is: um, Strategic priority two talks about victims and witnesses receiving the emotional support that they need. And obviously there's links between the trauma and experiences of victims and witnesses and mental health needs. Has the Department of Health fed into the drafting of these proposals? At, at this point they haven't and we would want to um, be doing further work with them. Uh, within the strategy, what um, we've, uh, we've identified um, within uh, Strategic priority one, for example, is um, about understanding the needs of victims, and within that, um, there there is a, a commitment to to look and and to do some research on understanding the the longer term needs, and that within that, the the, the longer term mental health needs, um, and and we would anticipate um, working with the Department of Health to to do that, and with the mental health champion as well. Um, so we we recognise the need. Uh, to be working more closely with the Department of Health on, on those issues as we move forward. But our first priority in that kind of three-year overview um, around mental health will be to scope out what those needs are and then to be engaging with the Health Department on how, how we better meet those needs. Okay, okay, thank you. I think it's important to have that um, cooperation and that relationship with the Department of Health. Uh, Chair, that's my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for um, coming to committee today um, on this. Um, appreciate there's been a number of questions already asked, um, but I'm going to start with the bu with budget. Um, 
there's no mention of resourcing in this strategy. And whilst I appreciate um and, and your answer to Gemma's question about about business cases needing to be done and more work to be done. So the has, has this strategy and the victims of crime commissioner been fully costed by the department? Um we've fully costed elements of the strategy we haven't costed the strategy as a whole because some of that the work needs to be developed we need to be looking at what our options are we need to be developing the actual model in order to um in order to to identify what the resource implications are so so for for where we're um where we're committing to do a piece of work but we're just at the start of that we, you know, we won't have the full, um, the full costings for those. Um, on the Victims of Crime Commissioner, we've looked at the cost of other commissioners, um, and we've we've done some initial estimates. Um, so we're estimating an annual cost of around six hundred and fifty thousand. Um, that though would will be determined by. Um, the outcome of consultation um, by an options appraisal post consultation um, by looking at issues of affordability, but but that six hundred and fifty thousand is based on the cost of a commissioner salary, the cost of um, supporting staff, the cost of office accommodation, and uh, and other other kind of administrative costs associated with that. Um, so. But it is still a high level estimate um, at, at this point. Um, and that will be the case in with um, with different commitments and different actions under the strategy. In some cases, we know exactly how much something's going to cost. In other cases, we we have we need to do that development work um, and then work through the options and the options and the preferred model will have to take account, um, take into account um, issues of affordability. I think you, Julie, appreciate that. And just, we, we've just had a briefing from the department on a budget um, and where we're at, and we're not in a very good situation. And with consulting on, and I appreciate um, what the department's doing and the need for the strategy, for absolutely, and for Victims of Crime Commissioner, 100%. Although, as you know, I, I would be still of the mind that we need a domestic abuse commissioner, but that's for another day. Um, you may get a response from me on that. <laughs> so, um, if, if we're consulting and, and appointing, you know, interim commissioners or a designate, but we don't actually have the budget for it. Um, Six hundred and fifty thousand pounds. I, I appreciate it's high level. That's only one part of this strategy, and if we don't have the money for that, you know, we've no guarantees that there's going to be budget for this within the Department of Justice or indeed, you know, it's so just. It's just, you know, we're, we're doing strategies and we're, we're consulting on things, but we might not be able to afford it. So I'm, I'm just looking, is there any guarantees that we will have, have that kind of money for the position? Um, and also just again on, on, on funding, um, the 2.4 million that we were discussing earlier on as part of the budget allocation for this financial year from the departments from the baseline for Gillen, is that the same works that has been identified with this strategy in terms of Gillen? So, so the um, that two point four million for Gillen. If I start with that, it will um, it will cover quite a lot of um, the ele the Gillen elements within this strategy um, uh, for within this year. Um, but some of the you know a lot of the the work of Gillen will result in recurring costs, and and that and, and I think this is a point that also applies to the the victims of crime commissioner those costs and those pressures for future years but it will be a matter for the minister and this uh, the senior uh, resource committee to to look and to prioritize how the departmental budget is allocated um so we've identified within this year we will need a hundred thousand to 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 set that uh, to set up the designate commissioner and we we can cover that um and then it will need to you know be part of the wider departmental uh, budget allocation and that prioritisation exercise um, for for future years. And just on that hundred thousand, and it's been met by existing budgets or budgets allocated for this financial year. Is that does that mean that uh, is there any other works that aren't being done, or is it replacing some other part of the work, or is that budget for this strategy? 
Uh, that that hundred thousand will sit within my divisional budget and uh, and will be put towards meeting this cost. And there, the two point four million uh, that is being prioritised for for Gillen will um, will also then be meeting elements of of this strategy. There are some elements within the strategy that um, haven't been hadn't been included in the SOC, uh, uh, the strategic outline case for um, for Gillen because the work still needed to be done. Um, so uh, so we'll, we will need to bid for uh, some additional funding uh, you know, as, as other elements of Gillen are, are developed. Um, so for example, um, uh, work to deliver the support for children um, recommendations we will need to do further work to cost uh, some of those um, recommendations and there will be additional resource implications that flow from those that we will need to bid for and that includes um, the, the the work that the, the minister has agreed to do to um, extend the under 13s uh, protocol um, so as that is incrementally rolled out across Northern Ireland there will be re resource implications that arise from those that that we will need to bid for um, and at this point in time we're just starting to cost what that will be and how we go about doing that so until we've done that piece of work we we, we won't know what the what the pressures will be arising from it okay thank you um so we have three more questions for you it's just that's all the budgetary ones just to clarify who is the victims of crime commissioner to report to or is it independent completely they will be independent of government, but we would um, be uh, we we would be expecting them. We, it would be a requirement that they uh, provide a, a strategic plan and that they would report annually on that strategic plan. Um, at this point, for the designate, we would be anticipating that that report would be made to the Minister of Justice, but that the minister would it would be published. Um, with the statutory commissioner, if we're looking at the role of that, we would, you know, want to consider all options, including, you know, laying that statutory report in front of the assembly uh, and, and things like that. But, but, but at this point, our focus is on the designate commissioner, who who won't be in a statutory role. Okay, no problem. Um, thank you for clarifying that. Um, just two, so a couple more points. One, just on the, uh, just some more detail if possible on what the strategic ro rollout of REC facilities for Northern Ireland means. It's under the year two and year three outcomes on page 34 of the draft strategy. And does this include a geographical spread across Northern Ireland? Okay, so where that is at the minute is we have um, two temporary rec facilities that have been established um, uh, within Craigavon and Belfast, um, and they are providing remote evidence facilities for um, both adults and children, but we've put in some measures to kind of separate, separate them out. Um, we're currently working on a, a better kind of longer term um, uh, Belfast facility that will have separate bespoke and tailored facilities for children and then a separate wing for, for adults. And we anticipate that that will come online early next year. And, uh, and we see it as, as providing rec facilities for Belfast. Um, for a, for a number of years at, at least. However, um, at this point, that, that would only be servicing the Belfast area because um, it needs to be quite, it needs to be in close proximity to the, the court. Yeah. Uh, so we're now looking at, you know, how, how we roll out those facilities more widely and they do come, um, then it, it raises interdependencies with other Gillen recommendations. So, for example, Gillen's recommendations around uh, support for children and consideration of a Barnabas type model. So, we'll want to take that into consideration as we're looking at well, what is what does remote evidence facilities for Northern Ireland look like? How close do those facilities need to be to the court? Are they truly re remote, or is there still a need for face-to-face um, -face consultations? 
in which case they, they need to be close to a court. Um, so we're evaluating um, and we have a program of evaluation in place for the, the temporary facilities and we want to look at what those operational impacts are in order to inform how we would develop the, the longer term strategy for remote evidence facilities in Northern Ireland. So currently we've got those two temporary ones and there is also another um, another facility in, uh, in Bishop Street that serves the, the Derry Court. Um, and uh, but but we'll want to look at how how that picture develops and evolves over time. But in order to uh, in order to do that, we need to look at what the operational impacts are. And so that's why we're saying you know that second year is really about informing how we develop that and you know looking at uh, you know resolving those issues around where. The facilities need to be looking at issues around you know a Barnabas type model because if so then children the, the the implication of that would be that children would would provide their evidence from that facility so there are still I think a lot of questions that need to be resolved um, and we just are in the process of gathering the evidence to, and you know to work with partners to 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 find the answers to those questions okay thank you um, very much finally and it's on um on children and young people and um you're not leaving me to tell you this but section 75 duties hold that um you know there needs to be a consultation with children and young people and those that are affected um and especially those um you know with the equality commission um guidance um having meaningful and inclusive consultation with children and young people um and the opportunity to engage with the public authority and whilst i absolutely appreciate the COVID 19 restrictions and there can't be any public you know sort of gatherings in terms of this um but having having them involved at the earliest possible stage um just like to to know what the intentions are of the department and how they're going to engage with children and young people on this you know victims of crime commissioner will be for all victims of crime that will include child and young people and um, victims of crime and also the strategy as well we know it, it it incorporates children and young people in it so just with regard to the stakeholder engagements what will there be children and young people organizations invited to to speak to yourselves or for to other leads um and and, and obviously I, I can't speak for children and young people but they're not sitting on citizen space um so how uh, how's that uh, and there's certainly you know even if it is you know rolling out advertising and so on on social media um not everybody knows that that's something that they can respond to um, and I had just wondering also if there going to be a child um, or young person friendly uh, consultation document put out as well. Um, in terms of developing the strategy, we've been working closely with NSPCC on, on that. So they've been part of the development of, of the strategy and uh, we are also discussing with them and with victim support about how we can work through them to to reach out to um, victims and and to young people um, in terms of doing some focus groups but using SPCC and victim support to run those for us appreciate that might not go far enough in terms of uh, uh, and we're, we're happy to engage with the um, the children and young persons commissioner and take advice from their office as well about what you know what other ways we can reach out and and, and engage further with with young people on that um, in terms of um, uh, we have we haven't done a specific young person consultation but we are working with um, victim support and then this PCC to look at well, what is the best way for us to do those focus groups so we haven't developed a separate um, consultation document but we have been looking at um, issues of accessibility um, for publishing online and things like that. Um, not sure if there's any further you, um, either of you wants to say on that? We, we literally have a few meetings set up with um, NSPCC and Young Witness Service and with um, Victim Support NI as well to We've, been, we've had conversations with them already, particularly around what you've said there around the accessibility for young people. Um, and we're looking to, to sort of, this is a more creative way we can do that online with social media and other platforms. But we've engaged initially with them, but we actually haven't then had the, the meeting. We're trying to get the consultation out and then we're gonna then say, right, 
how can we now do the best engagement and focus and target on those specific groups for young people, whether it is online, whether there's some other way that we can provide some materials that are more young, young, young person friendly. No, certainly. Thank you. Appreciate that. We're welcome. And obviously, it's the consultation is due to go live in seven days' time. So, you know, they certainly need to be afforded the opportunity to respond in the same way um, as everybody else would if they are on, on citizen space. And absolutely, I mean, they appreciate victim support and, and SPCC will obviously um, need to be involved in this and need to be central to this, given their experience and their engagement um, with children and young people. Um, on this, but obviously you've got the Children's Commissioner's Office, you've Children's Law Centre, there are a lot of, you know, youth groups, YMCAs, you've got a lot of people coming back into youth services. So I think it might, certainly might um, be an opportunity to, to engage at a community level um, rather than sort of just at a, at a higher a higher up level on citizen space and try and engage in terms of what does this mean for you? Um, so no, absolutely, uh, yeah. Just something I know I notice in a lot of consultations that we we do, and that's just in everywhere in government. You know, we're, we're talking about children. We're not really talking to them, and I appreciate it's difficult, but they're not going to sit on citizen space over their summer holidays. That's not going to happen. So, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Rachel, and and just to add to to Rachel's list, include youth because obviously we know that young children in care are not only more likely to become come to the attention of the, the justice system on the wrong side of it, they are also more likely to be to be victims. So I think it is it is important that, that they are included. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you and thanks for the presentation so far. Um, I suppose that, uh, whilst a lot has been answered, I do want to go back, I suppose, to the start, forgive me, but one of the assumptions, I suppose, at the outset of this is that in terms of the commissioner, you know, it's been decided that we cannot um, put the legislation forward in this mandate to put the commissioner on a statutory footing. Can I ask, how was that decided? Just, we would not be in a position, I think, to provide policy uh, instructions um, in, in time. We, uh, we wouldn't have the capacity to develop them, and we certainly, um, we, um, we, uh, we wouldn't meet the, the, the deadlines for being able to produce those um, for the miscellaneous provisions bill, for example. Um, and so it, it, it it does, I think, come down to uh, a, an, an issue of timing and capacity for us. Um, we will be able, um, and we are working to a very tight timeline to have a, a commissioner designate in, in post by the end of this mandate, but we wouldn't have the capacity to, um, to also um, meet those uh, legislative uh, timetable deadlines. Um, so. So, so really, it, it, it comes down to logistics and um, at the end of it. Okay. I appreciate that because I do recognise that it would be obviously a lot it would be preferential if we could just go straight to having a commissioner. And I did wonder what the legislative pieces that must sit across different departments and um, that do host commissioners, are they very similar pieces of legislation? Are they uniquely bespoke that that really has to look at the intricacies of the objectives of that commissioner and I suppose considering the the quite complex legislation that we are trying to put through and um, not least at this committee I, I did just wonder was this and, and forgive me if it is wrong and misleading but it did appear to me that this may have been something that would be largely um, or could be largely a cut and paste for the framework and then add them to the periphery of it. But I, I presume that was explored then. I think, I think in principle, there are a lot of similarities across various um, commissioners, but there are also a lot of differences as well. And I think uh, a few points, um, uh, the, certainly the reference group and it, and I think there is a lot of merit in this position. 
the reference group felt that there was value in having a having a, a commissioner designate who can scope the landscape and scope the need and scope what powers they might need and help to inform that mm -hmm. process. Um, so actually, it, you know, in the same, obviously a commissioner designate is not a pilot, but in the same way that you would use a pilot to inform kind of long-term mainstream services, actually having a commissioner designate in place can help to, to really shape that role and make sure that it is as effective as possible. So I think that's one point. Um, I did have a second point as you were speaking and it's gone out of my head. I'm really sorry. No, but that, that is a very important. valid point. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is a very valid point and I accept it. And it's not that I just wanted maybe to have on record that things were fully considered and the possibilities and you know that is a reasonable um, a reasonable argument to put forward that there is merit in actually an interim period and particularly when a lot of the financial um proposals are so high end that they haven't been pinned down and, and that overlay with Gillen and what, what might actually be you know, having a double effect, um, all should be the landscape, as you refer to it as, would be clearer, you know, in that role. But I suppose I did wonder then in terms of, um, and, I, and I'm shy about using the word pilot because I wouldn't like it um, to maybe be that there would, is there any um, way of, like, I suppose, taking an interim or, a, you know, non-statutory commissioner, is that time bound? So that there will be a point in time where that commissioner would cease to be in office and that legislation would need to be in place to meet that um sunset if you like or the you know the the end date of the statutory commissioner we we haven't taken that approach and we haven't if i'm if i'm being really honest we haven't even thought um thought that through as an option we're happy to take it back and discuss it with the minister um uh but we, we haven't looked at a sunset kind of uh, pro provision within, uh, not provision, but yeah, we haven't looked at it in that way and we're happy to go away and think about that. Okay, I, I'm thinking there is in terms of, um, you know, we know the, the difficulties that can arise, you know, you could have a very good um, statutory, non statutory commissioner and then all the limitations that are imposed on them not coming forward. But because if the time was too short, you would have to ask the question, will they have time and capacity to set up uh, an advisory group if they, that's what they feel is needed? And would that advisory group um, also have to cease with the priorities and the objectives of the interim commissioner? And I just would like to understand better that crossover period. And I suppose a little bit of pressure on any minister to know that we need to bring this into a more permanent statutory capacity sooner rather than later so it can be financed in your budgets because if yeah. it's this um periphery that's floating about out there and it hasn't actually been pinned down i would be fearful no budget allocation would ever have to be you know um absolutely found against it but trying to find the other advantages in the in the interim or the non-statutory commissioner given that it wouldn't be pinned down in legislation or the roles of that commissioner wouldn't be as scripted perhaps or um, as you know it wouldn't be um the, the parameters would be less is there then an opportunity for the department to look at this screaming obvious weaknesses such as the victims charter where you would say to any uh, uh, non-statutory commissioner this is a huge weakness and we are tasking you with this, you know, from the outset, so that they would use their time to meet some of the objectives that the that the department um, have been falling short on. And and I'll raise one other point with you, and um, just while I'm speaking, the Rachel very rightly referred to the the younger people, and you know, because a lot of the the work, especially at Barnhouse um, model and stuff, is specific to younger people. But I am also mindful of older people and um, people who perhaps have language barriers and I think of trafficking and there are a lot of uh, reach and I know um, the victim support are very good at this and, and it's reassuring to know they're at the table but given that this 
commissioner is to be a commissioner for all victims. Um, I suppose I would like to see that that there would be some transparency in the work that was done to make sure the consultation reached as many people as it should. So maybe on those two points, I'd appreciate. Um, in the first, on your first point around the, the, the charters, um, we are proposing that the, um, that, that the commissioner, one of their core functions would be to review the operation and delivery of the charter entitlements. So obviously it's for criminal justice organisations to meet those entitlements, but we see a real role for the, the commissioner in, in looking at you know, how that's being done and when it's not being done and, and making recommendations about how we should be delivering those, those obligations. So absolutely that we've, we've included that as, um, as a core function. I think it's still something that, you know, the delivery of those entitlements and, and issues around the visibility and the accessibility of the charters still actually sit with us and it, you know, and, and so Jenny has made that clear mm -hmm. that there's a, there's a program of work that we need to do to improve both delivery and awareness of the charters. Um, but there is a role, I think, for the commissioner, and certainly we're writing that into the, 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 the proposed functions um, okay. that, that, that they should be advising and scrutinizing and reviewing uh, there. Um, so, and your second, your second point was about um, making sure that we're consulting with as wide a range uh, and uh, certainly that is our intention in, in developing the um, the uh, the victims of the victims of crime commissioner proposals. Uh, the reference group was made up of a very wide range of uh, representatives, including um, inclu including the commissioner for older people's office and um, H and I. H and I were um, also represented on that, so they've had. Uh, uh, a really big role in helping to inform the thinking around the commissioner. Uh, the minister intends to meet with the reference group again during that consultation process, and we will be reaching out. Um, you know, we've talked about citizen space, but we will be proactively be reaching out to a wide range of relevant um, stakeholders as well to you know, to to show them the consultation and to ask them for for their views. Um, so. so I mean, it, we want we want this to be an, an effective uh, strategy, and we want the commissioner to um, to actually deliver on the outcomes that we you know that, that we've anticipated. So we want it to be as informed as possible, and we will be. Um, I appreciate that we haven't set that out, um, and we can write to the commission. Uh, we we can write to the committee and say exactly how we're going to you know who we're going to be consulting with, if that's helpful and. and providing that extra layer of transparency. Okay. We're happy to do that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, just come back to the piece on the the victim's charter. Um, I suppose what I don't want to see happen is that we don't need a commissioner to come in to recommend that we have to communicate the charters better. We know that. You know, the department have been told that time and time again. I, I, I suppose I'm asking a question, and this is where budget definitely comes into play, is it not that we've reached the point now where we take a commissioner and say, actually, you have a part to play in the promotion of the charter. You have a role to play in it, rather than pointing out to us again what we already know. Yeah, um, we, we we can absolutely look at that. And uh, um, that would be one of the things that, you know, post-consultation, we may be then when we're presenting revised proposals after consultation, we, we can look at that. I do think there is still a role for the department and agencies in promoting that, that as well. And we have done some work towards that, but there's certainly, we you know, I think we want a commissioner who can be a number, who can be in a number of roles. And so part of that is about actually telling us when we're not doing right. Yeah. And part of it is about um, working in partnership to do things like promote, um, So um, and that's, yeah, we want to have that that kind of broad range within the, the relationship um, with the commissioner where they have the teeth to 
you know, to highlight and criticise if necessary, but they also are able to work alongside to, you know, to, to do things like promoting the charters. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't think anybody else has indicated. Um, just to, to raise again, there have been a number of concerns raised. Just, and I know Sinead has spoke to the, the fact that um, this won't be in statute and, and asking the question around why not. I mean, I actually accept that, there, that I don't, uh, the Minister has outlined very clearly that her draft and people have, have limitations as well, so we accept that. I, I'm, I probably still just do have some concerns about the Commissioner coming in to be in without being in statute. But I'm not opposed to it. I have concerns, but with, without opposition at, at this point. So, thank you very much for the presentation. Appreciate you coming and answering the questions. And my screen has gone blank, so I sincerely hope none of our members are looking in to ask questions <laughs> and we've missed them. But you've escaped if they have. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chair. If broadcasting could bring all our members into the spotlight. We can't see them on my screen, but if we can see them on the the screen in the room here, that would be helpful. We're here, Chair. So members, because my screen has went blank on on my computer here, if I can't see if you're indicating to speak, so I'm gonna have to ask you just to shout if, if you want in um, or indicate by, by waving your hand whatever whatever is suitable for yourself apologies for that so we move on now to agenda item six which is the protection from stock and bill and the proposals for oral evidence sessions members if if i can refer you to pages 129 to 141 of the table pack for the relevant papers And just to remind members that the call for written evidence on the protection from stock and bill closed on Friday the 16th of April. And at last week's meeting, the committee agreed to place the written submissions received from organisations on the committee bill webpage and to consider proposals for oral evidence sessions at the meeting today. Members also noted that the Public Prosecution Service and the Rainbow Project had asked for a short extension to the deadline. Both submissions have now been received and are included in the table pack together with an additional submission received from an individual. They will be added to the electronic bill pack and both the PPS and Rainbow Project submissions will be placed on the committee webpage. Suggestions for oral evidence sessions are set out at paragraph 9 of the clerk's memo, which was emailed to all members yesterday. So can I just ask if members are content to sh schedule the oral evidence sessions as outlined in the clerk's memo, or if you have any additional anything you want to add to it or remove, Rachel, Rachel. Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair. No, nothing to, uh, to sort of add to it. But in, in terms of um, holding a meeting with the CEO of the Scottish charity Action Against Stalking. Certainly, just from my experience with the domestic abuse bill, I engaged um, quite a lot with um, Scottish uh, CEOs of you know and those who had experience of of implementing legislation. And I honestly I, I can't say enough of how important that was, just in terms of looking at our bill and looking what has already been in place. So I would certainly welcome uh, even a formal engagement um, with them, but happy with an informal. But I think that would be very useful for the committee to be able to compare. You skipped on to my next bit, but okay, Rachel. <laughs> um, no, I, I agree with you, Rachel, I do think. And I think it actually would be beneficial for us to, to... I'm not opposed to an informal meeting, but I do think it would be beneficial to do it in a formal setting because, obviously, when it's formal, that means the public can see and hear what the CEO was saying, and I think that would be beneficial. It, if In an informal setting, only the committee members will have the benefit of it. So I would prefer an informal session, if that is possible, to do, Clerk, and I, I appreciate that we're very time constrained, so I'm not going to absolutely insist on that, but if it's possible, I, I certainly would prefer it. No other members have indicated. Can all members be brought into the spotlight? It's just when they're not in, we can't see if they're indicating. Okay. Um, so once the evidence sessions have been completed, the 
position can be reviewed to assess whether any further oral evidence is required if members are content. That's how we'll proceed. Okay. Agenda item seven then is this Jenny report on public protection arrangements and, and an update on the progress to implement strategic recommendation four. Members, if I can refer you to pages four five seven to five two four of your meeting pack for the relevant papers. And just to remind you that in October 2020, the committee considered an update provided by the Department of Justice on progress to deliver the action plan to address the strategic and operational recommendations in the Sajini report of the public arrangement, public protection arrangements, and that was published in October 2019. Okay, sorry, um, and. The committee agreed to request further clarification on the progress to deliver strategic recommendation four, which relates to conducting an outcomes review to better understand the causes of increasing or decreasing numbers of offenders in each risk category, development of performance indicators that will feature in the business plans of PPANA, Strategic Management Board agencies, and the introduction of performance indicators for PPNA's public engagement outcomes. The Department wrote on the 11th of February setting out the reasons for the delay in providing a detailed response and has now provided the update requested. The paper outlines the SMB are due to meet on the 1st of June 2021 to consider and, if applicable, approve the proposed performance indicators for PPNI's public engagement outcomes, which will be included in the PPNA annual report. The response does not provide any information on the results of the outcomes review or progress to develop performance indicators which should feature in the business plans of the SMB agencies. I would ask can members note the information that's been provided and I would propose that we request information on the results of the outcomes review and progress, and progress to develop performance indicators which should feature in the business plans of the SMB agencies as part of the update on implementation of all recommendations with the Department is due to provide before the summer recess. Are members content? Rachel? Rachel Woods want to come in on that? Thank you, Chair. No, absolutely. I'm content with that. I'm just reading through the two letters. Obviously, we got a letter in February and then a letter there in this pack. And the February letter said that there was going to be a meeting in uh, in March and it had been rescheduled from October. Um, but I'm seeing now that the, the, the meeting is June. So did the March meeting happen or is June the March meeting, as it were? Um, and it, what effect of the delay, if there is any, from October then from last year to June this year? But certainly, um, I would welcome some updated information before summer recess would be would be handy. Absolutely, Rachel, no problem. Okay, so agenda item eight then, members, the Department of Justice corporate plan 2019 to 22 and draft business plan 2021 22. If I can refer members to pages 526 to 578 of your meeting pack for the relevant papers. The Department has provided a copy of its corporate plan for 2019-22 and draft business plan 21-22, which sets out the objectives and actions developed to advance the Department's priorities and which take on board the Department's responsibilities under the PFG. The Department has indicated that the plan is shorter and more focused than previous years, which recognises the resource pressure faced across the Department and provides the opportunity for the plan to adapt to unexpected developments like some of those faced in the current financial year. Um, members, are you content to note both of these? And do you wish to submit any views or comments on, or require any further information or f clarification? Okay. So, members, if you're content, then we'll request a progress update on delivery of the objectives and actions on the business plan in October 2021. Okay, and um, we'll also ask for details of the funding that has been allocated to each action of the business plan. Okay, members, content? Silence is contentment. Okay. Um, agenda item nine, then, is the Committee Forward Work Programme, May and June 2021. Members, if I can refer you to page 580 to 592 of your meeting pack and 143 of your table pack for the relevant papers. 
The Department has written to request a number of changes to the Committee Forward Work Programme agreed at the meeting on the 25th of March 21. Um, the changes include the deferment of three written briefing papers and one oral evidence session in May, and changes to the timing of the provision of finance information due to changes of the overall timetable. The Department also wants to schedule an additional SL1 on the earliest available date in May. The Department has also now requested the postponement of the planned oral evidence session on the results of the consultation on proposals for the reform of rehabilitation of offender periods and the proposed way forward from the meeting on the 27th of March to some time before the summer recess. Members, an oral evidence session on the principles of the Justice Bill, which was previously the miscellaneous um, provisions ju Justice Bill, will need to be scheduled before the second stage. A briefing on the June monitoring round and other financial information will also have to be accommodated in early June. So, if members are content to agree the changes requested by the Department to the Committee for Work Programme and to schedule the additional SL1 for the meeting on the 13th of May 2021, are members content? Yeah. Okay, Christine. Agenda item 10, then, members, is the correspondence. There are four items of correspondence in pages 594 to 684 of the meeting pack and one item of correspondence at page 145 to 172 of the table pack. I would like to draw your attention to the correspondence in the table pack, which is a copy of the Sejini Annual Business Plan incorporating the inspection programme for 21-22 and the proposed inspection programme for 22-23, which will be subject to consultation. Members, the Chief Inspector is happy to provide any further information or discuss the plan and inspection programme, if that would be helpful. So, if members are content to note the business plan and inspection programme, unless any further information is required. Okay. And if members are content to action the items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet, or if you have any other issues to raise in relation to correspondence. No. Okay. Thank you. Agenda item 11 then is chairperson's business, of which I have none. You'll be glad to hear. And agenda, agenda item 12 then is any other business. And Rachel, I'm going to invite you in in relation to the, uh, an email that you sent yesterday in relation to the NI Affairs Committee report on cross border cooperation on police and security and criminal justice after Brexit. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you say, it's just um, about that report. So members may be aware that um, the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee at Westminster reported on cross-border cooperation on policing, security and criminal justice after Brexit and had a number of recommendations. Um, so I am wondering if members would be agreeable that the committee could write to the department and the minister asking for their response to the conclusions of the report, uh, notably on the loss of CIS-2 and the PSNI request for the Centre of Excellence in Northern Ireland, and if there's any such plans to bring this forward. Absolutely, Rachel. To totally agree. Um, I'm content to do that. We'll write to the department and ask for, for those. Okay. Members, is that everything, Rachel? You're happy enough? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, members, unless anybody else has any other business, agenda item 13 then is our date, time and place of next meeting. So the next meeting of the committee will take place on Thursday the 6th of May at 2 p.m. in room 30 in Parliament Buildings. Okay, thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Okay. Goodbye.